Hello, my name is Michael O'Keefe, aka The Movie List. If you enjoyed this interview and want to hear more top-notch film industry conversations, please press the thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and hit the bell to stay in the know. Hello, Brent Gaylor. Please tell my audience how your short film, Discriminator, is a little different than other short films. Well, it's uh, what I call an interactive documentary, Michael. So um, the, the film is different for each person, basically. It's similar to the film I made, uh, Do Not Track. Um, in this case, it uses your webcam to sort of show you how facial recognition works. Yes. Um, how long have you been covering this, this subject of, uh, maybe not this specifically, but of, of, of tech and, and civil liberties? Um, well, I, I've always made films that are about the internet. Um, I made a feature in 2008 called Rip a Remix Manifesto. That was more about how the internet was sort of changing how we thought about music, really. That was kind of like how, how we started that project. And then we got into to, uh, remix and mashups and copyright and the sort of folk culture of the internet. And that time was super positive, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of... Uh, this century, the internet could do no wrong. And then as um, I started working in the field, I worked for the Mozilla Foundation for about 10 years and, and you know, was really um, committed to building web technologies, you know, with along with the rest of us, but maybe me a few years earlier, I noticed that um, there was some sort of uh, chips in the armor of, of the internet's sort of moral authority in, in, in that uh, much of the business models of the internet were starting to be based on gathering as much personal information from people as possible. And so that was the, the topic of Do Not Track, the series we did about uh, privacy. Um, but then as, you know, technology has evolved, this idea of surveillance capitalism has moved into many more areas of our life, especially as artificial intelligence technology has progressed. And um, one of the ways that this is sort of most visible is with facial recognition technology, which uses machine learning to, to um, analyze, you know, millions of different faces to be able to um, sort of seamlessly spot your face when it's needed. And, and you know, we, we've all encountered this technology. Um, you know, when you're using a Snapchat filter, that's using facial recognition technology, or when you're using, um, you know, face unlock on your iPhone, that's facial recognition technology. Or, you know, oftentimes you may actually um, be subject to facial recognition technology when you're not aware of it. Like if you're at a, you know, some airports or even, you know, in some countries as you're walking down the street. Um, and so that's a, a, you know, in an area, one of these areas, where the technology is moving a lot faster than the, the law or the sort of civilian oversight. Um, and so I got interested in that, but it, I got, um, you know, particularly interested when I realized that a lot of my own photos um, had actually been included in facial recognition databases that are used to build that technology. Yeah, it was, it was Flickr, right? Yeah, it was it, basically Flickr, um, you know, and this is sort of like uh, related to what I was mentioning earlier about my my film Rip and the sort of positive feelings that we had about the internet in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, Flickr was like, Flickr was actually one of the first social networks, right? And it was sort of this place that you would, you would upload, you know, photos of your life and what was going on. And, and it was a way for sort of early internet adopters to kind of, um, keep in touch and to sort of build community and photos are just a great way to do that as Mark Zuckerberg, you know, figured out later. Um, and then with Flickr, there was also this option really early on. Flickr was the first photo sharing site to enable users to release their works under Creative Commons licenses. And what Creative Commons licenses are, are kind of a, um, a legal system that allows a user to say, you know, in fact, I'm okay with you copying my image. I'm okay with you uh, using it to to um, build something else, like another collage, or if you need it in a website that you're making. You know, it's kind of like, uh, oftentimes people aren't sure, you know, we can all save as when we do a Google search for, you know, when we're building something online, and we kind of know that that's not really right. Mm -hmm. um, but with Creative Commons, the idea was like, hey, let's build this you know, um, 
commons of images that we're okay with people sharing. And so I was one of those people who were releasing my images that way. Seems crazy in retrospect, because it was like, you know, it's it, it's your life that you're saying to someone else, go ahead and, and make something like this with. But what I had thought people would do is make like PowerPoint presentations or weird collages or, you know, art. But what I didn't know what was happening was that um, computer scientists were sort of we're starting to collect all of those photos into these databases um, for training facial recognition algorithms. And so mine ended up um, in something called the Yahoo Flickr Creative Commons 100 million, which is 100 million images of everything um, in the world that had been released under that kind of license. Um, and then there was a, a derivative or like a copy of that database that was just for people's faces and that was called mega face um and so yeah I, i'm in there um and and many millions of other people are and so um that's why i decided like oh i should make a doc about this and and that's what discriminator is groovy so what do you think the balance needs to be between civil liberties and security online it's like a a, a big question yeah. Michael, and it kind of depends on what, um, you know, what liberty we're talking about and what, what, what security we're talking about. And I think that, you know, um, one thing that folks are starting to sort of realize is that a, a sort of a base layer, a sort of like table stakes, if you like, is that people need to be able to have consent over any information that is personally identifiable or that describes their um, biometrics. So um, your face is a biometric identifier. That's why it can be used to unlock your phone because no one has the same face as you. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of trouble that somebody could get into by making a copy of your face, right? It's mm -hmm. not only something that just sort of like, you know, um, that, that we kind of have a visceral reaction too, that we're like, ah, I don't, you know, I don't want somebody doing something with my face because it feels weird, mm -hmm. but it's also a security concern, right? It's also, you know, like think about all those science fiction films that you've seen where uh, somebody, you know, takes a copy of someone's finger or their face or whatever to, to access the secret vault. I mean, right? We, we, we don't want that happening. Right. Um, but we're, there's also this issue that we, that I talked about in the, in the doc, which is that once we sort of start becoming our faces and our bodies uh, becoming data, um, we will experience this thing that happens with any type of data, which is that it will be it will be used for something that we didn't anticipate or that that is outside of the original use of that data. So I experienced that with my Flickr photos, right? Mm -hmm. I thought they were going to be used for a collage. They, were in, they ended up being used to train facial recognition systems that are monitoring Uyghur Muslims in China. I did not want that. I would not have consented to that if somebody asked me for that. Um, so rather than thinking about like, what's this balance? I think we need to start shifting to like, what, how do we want to think about consent for uses that we cannot possibly imagine? And that's a pretty tricky problem. But, and, and so we have to sort of recognize that it is an issue and then start to say, okay, until we figure that out, these are the areas that society is going to say are off limits. Facial recognition could be one of those, right? We, we could say like, you know what? We're not ready for this. We're, we, we, we should not be deploying this on the streets because we, we can't figure out how somebody could possibly give their consent to that information. And then there's this other tricky issue with facial recognition in that it's been proved by researchers to work differently for um, different ethnicities. So, and th this is a, you know, widely considered this problem of bias. And so um, if you think about, uh, you know, how AI systems work, you know, they, they look at many different things and then learn to recognize that thing. Um, so imagine that you and I had built a, we we're trying to build a fruit detector and we only showed it uh, apples and then it didn't recognize an orange as uh, a piece of fruit. We couldn't say that we'd built a fruit detector, we'd have built an apple detector. Well, that's kind of happened with faces. Some of these early systems were trained on databases that were primarily featured 
uh, white people. And so then if you tried to show these systems uh, a, a person of color, it just did not recognize them as a person. Um, and so that has all kinds of problematic outcomes. Uh, one of those could be that it leads to false arrests of black people because the system isn't quite tuned to, to those faces. Or the other thing is that if we begin to rely on those systems, then people of color um, are not offered the same opportunities. Um, and then you might get into this system where you say, OK, well, we what we need is to get more uh, images of people of color into these databases, which is, in fact, IBM tried to do with their diversity and faces data set. And so you start to get into this arms race and, and, and start to collect more and more and more and more information. Whereas I think what we should be doing is saying like, here are the situations where this uh, technology is not appropriate. Very neat. And, and tell me what, what people could do if they think the surveillance state is a violation. Well, I, I think that, you know, much like an issue like climate change, this is sort of a systemic issue. And so oftentimes that is our instinct to wonder like, hey, what should I do uh, about this about this issue? I think it's more like, what do we need to do about this issue? So how do we want to think about um, talking to elected officials or sort of building grassroots power so that um, you know, our elected officials understand that there is uh, broad uh, opposition to these? Um, my role in that is is trying to let people know about it or, or sort of trying to craft a narrative that that people um, can identify with. And, you know, as for your individual, um, you know, what what you can do, I think it's about, again, trying to think about when you release a piece of data, what could all the potential uses of this data be, which is it's kind of like this unanswerable question, right? Like what? Like like I don't know if you did the census that got sent out. You should have. But the reason that they gave that they're asking that that for that census data of like who, how many people live in your house, what languages do you speak, what's you know uh, all those kind of census type questions. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to use that data in as wide a variety of ways as possible, and I support those uses, right? Mm -hmm. That but that is in a uh, uh, that's sort of in the public interest. Now, if you gave the same data to Facebook, what can Facebook do with with that information? What can Facebook do with information about how happy you are? You know, uh, should should are you comfortable with Facebook being able to identify your face in any picture? Because they can do that. Um, what could they possibly do with that? What you know, in which ways would you be comfortable? with uh, a corporation like that being able to make decisions about you based on your face, uh, whether your face is happy, whether your face is seen with someone else's face, uh, whether your face is aging, whether your face looks a little bit depressed, whether your face, um, you know, is unhealthy. Oh, would you be okay with Facebook maybe noticing that you have a, a skin melanoma? Would it, are they the appropriate uh, entity to have that data? Yes or no. And so um, if your answer to any of those questions are, I don't want them knowing any of that information about me because I don't trust their, um, I don't trust them, then you shouldn't give Facebook information about your face, um, you know, just so that you can have a, a cute cat filter on you. Because mm -hmm. right now there's, we don't really have a legal framework that that allows them a way to say like yes to this, yes to this use and no to that use. And until we get to to something like that where you have that granularity of being able to choose. You know, my advice would be to not give your face to companies like that. How long did it take to make Discriminator? And was it a fun challenge? Oh, it was super fun. Yeah, it was kind of my pandemic project. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, I don't know, about a year. About a year, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Are you a fan of the Citizen Four documentary, which focuses on Edward Snowden and his revelations filmed during that period? Yeah, I mean, I think it, um, Citizen Four is an example of, um, you know, how important it is to have, you know, media makers that are trying to put forward narratives that maybe maybe aren't the dominant narrative around a particular issue. So I think like in that case, Laura Poitras was, you know, really um kind of an ally of Edward Snowden in getting that information out. And we should really be thankful to 
to Poitras for that because, you know, prior to the Snowden revelations, we really had no idea the degree to which the U.S. government was cooperating with big technology companies to, um, you know, make information that we'd shared with those those companies accessible. So, of course, I'm a fan. Yeah. Nice. Is there a way for people to watch your other work? Yep. Yeah. Well, Discriminator uh, is going to be available for everybody at discriminator.film. And uh, Do Not Track, it, uh, the documentary is, is probably best found with a, a, a search online. And my film, Rip, a remix manifesto, is available through the National Film Board of Canada. Um, and all of that you can find on my website, impostermedia.com. Funky. How does it feel to have Discriminator included at the Tribeca Film Festival? It's great. I mean, I wish I could go. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I had a project at Sundance this year, too. But, you know, on the, on the other hand, it's pretty cool to be, you know, um, in Little Victoria and, and have a and have this ability to have work shown um, in places that I have a lot of respect for around the world and to connect with audiences. So, you know, that's the sort of great thing about the Internet um, and to be able to have made it with people around the world. So I'm um, happy about that, too. Yeah, this is pretty cool. All from Victoria. Which yeah. I've been to, by the way. I've been to Victoria. Nice. What did you think? I enjoyed it. I went there for my cousin's wedding. It was a good time. Cool. Yes. What filmmaking advice do you have for activist filmmakers? For activist filmmakers? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that it's important to have you know, a reason why you're making the work. And so in, in, in that sense, I think, you know, making a film is hard. And so in, in some sense, activist filmmakers, uh, you, you know, you have a gift in that you, you, you know that it's really important what you're doing. Um, and so I think that for activist filmmakers, I think it's really important to have your vision for, for what the world that you wish existed what what does that world look like and then wh who has the power to make that world possible um and then think about those people as your audience so oftentimes when we're making uh, a film we'll we'll you know if somebody asks us who's your audience well it's like everybody it's people who watch television <laughs> um and that's you know that's not or or use the internet and that's not actually a helpful audience for you you need to think about the people that you have the ability to reach within you know like with discriminator it's a completely 100 percent independent work which is it's unusual for me usually i'm working with um you know a broadcaster or somebody who has who has an audience and then i'll say okay who is this audience and then how do i want to talk to those folks so that they'll listen to me right if i'm making something for you know for cbc um i know that that could be anybody really that maybe it skews a little bit older or um you know they haven't you know had a chance to think about a, an issue um in, in as great a detail as somebody who's like you know sp spent four years studying it right um so you have to think about you have to think about that audience and in the case of activist work it's really thinking about that audience in terms of who has the ability to to sort of help you realize that vision of the world that that you want and then what do they need what like how would they need to change in order for that that world to come into existence so for some people it's just a matter of like oh they don't know about this and so that you know their role in helping that world exist is that they can be you know more knowledgeable about that and maybe the narrative that they have about that issue has changed or you might actually want them to go and like you know, you, maybe your audience is like more advanced and you want them to take action. They already know about it, but they need to sort of like know, know what they can do. Um, and that's again, that's probably not, you know, your, your broad CBC audience. Maybe that is maybe a more niche audience, mm -hmm. which is sort of what I've done with discriminator. That's kind of like a, a, a you know, maybe a little bit more nerdy, maybe more based, you know, specifically for internet culture. Yeah. And there's yeah. sort of a call for action at the end too. Yeah, exactly. Um, in, in, in this film, 
um, it, we were asking people to support a group called the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project in New York. Um, you know, and the way that they can do that is give them money. Um, <laughs> and, and and in this, actually, in the case of this film, just by watching it, um, they have the potential to be give them money to give them money because we're using um, a web monetization uh, standard. So if folks are sort of signed up for uh, a subscription to the service called Coil, um, some percentage of that subscription that they pay will go towards the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. Um, so yeah, this is like a, a very unabashedly activist and uh, nerdy doc. Yes, it is. Brett, thank you for your time. Is there anything else you would like to say about Discriminator before I let you go? Uh, no, I just everybody should watch it and then pass it on to their friends and tweet about it and, and let everybody know. And and let me know if, if anybody listening watches it, you can find me on Twitter at Remix Manifesto, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Take it easy. <laughs>